Kansas City! <laughs> oh, it is so good to be back in your loving arms in this magical kingdom, which is the beating heart of America. You do know that in the rest of the world, everyone refers to Paris as the Kansas City of Europe, right? I want to tell you, if you only remember one thing from tonight, I love your city. I really, really do. If I die, I want this to be on my tombstone. Oh, I truly believe this is the very best of our nation, the most secure pocket of our realm, where we store the best barbecue to be found on this entire planet. And if there are other planets on those two, Last month I was here, and my dreams are still filled with meat sweats <laughs> from Joe's and Arthur Bryant's. As the late great Anthony Bourdain once said, barbecue may not be the road to world peace, but it's a start. <laughs> also, this city Everyone you meet is just so bloody nice. It's genuinely amazing. It's like you just bump into someone, they are guaranteed to be the loveliest, most caring, warmest, wonderful human being you've ever met. There's just a joyousness in the air here. It lingers like the smell of burnt ends. The people make this place. Everyone here loves living here. I went to, to, to Town Topic Burger. I think you can do a bit better for Town Topic Burger. I went at 3 a.m. for a double cheeseburger and a strawberry milkshake. And where I'm from, New York City, I'll go and get a burger at 3 a.m., but believe me, I'm taking my nunchakas with me. But here in Kansas, it was the most blissed out, chilled, uplifting experience, and it made me love your city all the more, as does the fact that this city is proper football. You can't really tell the modern story of this city without the intertwining of the game we love, from the NASL oh, to the indoor leagues and the mighty Wiz. Now sporting Kansas City, I've got so much respect for the tiny cauldron that you play in. It is a national treasure. And don't get me started on your KC current. Sorry, let me get that right. Your record-breaking 17 games without a loss, Kansas City current. Teal has taken over this town. I was here three weeks ago, and I almost got run over by not one, but three trams with KC current players on the side of them. And it was almost an honor. KC, baby! I mean, this vibrant culture that you have created is why the United States men's national team is coming here tomorrow night to its most defensible position. 76,000 capacity, Arrowhead Stadium. <laughs> Let's be honest, the shock defeat against Panama last Monday, it was not so bueno. But for a do or die game against Uruguay to save our Copa America dreams, there's no place I'd rather be than right here. Which is why I want to raise my third first Michelob Ultra of the day. <laughs> oh. To this incredible moment in time which bonds all of us. The Men's World Cup is just 711 days away. But who's counting? Eight games will be played in this very city. Our young men's squad will please God still be on their hero's journey. And if they are, tomorrow night's game at Arrowhead 
will be the part of the movie where the hero appears to be on the precipice of the cliff, appears to be on death's door, only to snap back to life like the Undertaker meme and save the day. As Christian Pulisic himself put it after that game against Panama, we've got to go and play the best game of our lives, and that's it. That's the approach for the players. For the fans, we know, because you are them. I mean, Uruguay, one of the best teams in the world or in our backyard. To paraphrase Tyrion Lannister, there's brave men knocking at our door. Let's go and beat them. And tonight, we're going to break all of it down. We're going to dig deeper into the United States. We're going to relive the Euros. England live! Holy crap! <laughs> By the way, I am more American than, Ke uh, than Kenny Powers now. So like, I don't give a crap about England. But I will say, they stared into the abyss tonight and they heard a nation of tabloid readers scream back. <laughs> Let's survive to tell the tale. We're going to go and tell tales of the Cooper to come. We're going to savor this truly unique city. And to do it, we've got an amazing bevy of guests, starting with the molasses to my brown sugar. An OG football fan in this nation, the man who many believe is still the best coaching mind America's ever produced. <laughs> Even though the character he played is fictional, he's the star, he's the co-creator of Ted Lasso. It's my friend. Let's have a big Kansas City welcome for Mr. Brendan Hay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us again in your wonderful, wonderful city. It's a pleasure every time. Oh, Raj, you're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing me in front of my Midwestern friends. Raj. <laughs> that was my seventh first Michelob Ultra of the day. Oh, Brenny, I'm propping up with my Camarena here. Brenny, 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 it's so bloody good to see you. Can we I are... say, uh, Roger, we get just real quick. You, um, you've really taken to calling me Brenny uh, lately, and um, I'm flattered, and you're someone who I will let do that. Um, I find Brenny to be so, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, emasculating a nickname that it l <laughs> literally it's a joke nickname between me and my fiance, where like, if I'm in trouble or if she needs something, she'll be like, Brenny, and uh, like, uh-oh, here it comes. But now you do it, and somehow... I find it delightful. But no one else is allowed to call me Brenny. These two people, that's it. Ah! What have I done? What have I done? What have you done? Can I just tell you, I only call it you because it's what Paxton calls his brother. Well, that's, that's different. That's cute. They've seen each other's penises. I mean, they grew up <laughs> together. That's fine. <laughs> and so is she, but not you. <laughs> Unless tonight's the night. I am so confused <laughs> in every regard. And I'm going to move on to keep this one family friendly. Um, but Brendan Hunt, which sounds very formal. My wife only calls me Roger when I'm in trouble. So that is so like orcs for me. But 24 hours out from Tim Ream against Luis Suarez. From Christian Pulisic against Ronald Araujo. How, how would you describe the level of frenzy and calm in the hunt's head? Um, golly, um, it is as uh, calm and yet percolating like a, um, a freshly cut and sauced pulled pork sandwich. Um, and that's called pandering to the audience, by the way. That's absolute <laughs> pandering to the audience. Like, it's all there, it's all there, but it can go any different direction. Bite your arm off for a pulled pork sandwich right now. It's very easy to distract me from the football. But you have quite a relationship with this city. It's a special bond that you have. I know you're here regularly for the magnificent Thunder Gong. Yes. Uh, 
Yes, I have, uh, I have osmoted uh, a, a great love for Kansas City just by, by dint of hanging out with, uh, with Jason Sudeikis, who um, I've come down here for every year. Like, uh, I'm sure more of you know uh, Big Slick, um, big old charity thing that happens in summer. Uh, the sort of a young but growing cousin is Thundergong. We do it every November at the Uptown, and um, it's like a rock and roll comedy event to benefit uh, Steps of Faith, uh, which is a charity that benefits... Um, amputees and helps them buy prosthetic limbs, which are insanely expensive. In fact, literally, talking to Matt Beasler downstairs, I now know that um, a prosthetic limb costs twice what Matt Beasler was paid his rookie year at Sporting KC. Um, so uh, remember us in, uh, in November. It's at the Uptown, and it's always a good time. God bless. And thank you, Kansas City, for supporting Thunder Gong and Steps of Faith the way you have. Uh, for those who don't know, what Thunder Gong is. Let's just give you a little bit of a taste. Oh, Brenny. Guests. There's cool guests at Thunder Gong. Look at that. By the way, that is the most B-52s thing that ever B-52'd. So I haven't been here for that. And by the way, we know why it's called Thunder Gong when you wear those pants, Brendan. <laughs> How... <laughs> and that's why he's allowed to call me Brenny. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe this magnificent city in your own words? Um, gosh, yeah, I, mean, I'm still, I don't quite have enough data to do it with any decisiveness, but I will say everyone I meet um, has... Frankly, I like that quality that I find in Chicagoans and in Londoners um, of being uh, immediately witty and immediately unstressed and, and witty to a high level of uh, intelligence and reference level. Um, I have always felt immediately uh, at home here. Um, so, yeah, e even at a Royals game. I was at the Royals game today, and folks, I'm a Sox fan, and yet Royals had a good old time at the Royals game today. <laughs> so I love being here every time I come. Tell them who you met. Who would I meet? Oh, well, you've opened up a can of, you ca can of worms here. Uh, so I met, uh, uh, you guys know this guy, George Brett? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know who doesn't know George Brett is Brett Goldstein. Um, <laughs> despite the fact that um, in the, in the <laughs> you opened up a can of worms, Roger, but we're going to go for it. In, in the, uh, the season one Ted Lasso writer's room, before Brett Goldstein had become Roy Kent, and when we're all getting to know each other, like, you, you, in writer's room, you just like talk about weird stuff that comes up, and of course, as will happen with any uh, group that has you know, more than six men in it, at some point over the course of four months, someone goes, hey, you ever see the YouTube video where George Brett talks about shitting his pants in Vegas? <laughs> and, and we watched that several times. Cut to... Years later, Brett Goldstein, now a, uh, a double Emmy winning, super successful stand-up, um, is, is going on tour and I know he's coming to Kansas City. And I buy him a present that I had wanted to buy him since we first watched that first video back in the writer's room, which is a Royals jersey with a five Brett on the back. And I was like, Brett, here you go, enjoy your present. When you go to Kansas City, if you come out and you do the fucking Jamie Tart with your back to the awnings with the Brett on it, you, you'll be a king there. Or put it under your black t-shirt that you insist on wearing and rip it off and it'll be there. Now, he did not do that. But today, um, uh, yesterday, the Royals called because they knew I was coming. They were being very uh, uh, generous with their hosting and with uh, me and my family. And like, would you like to throw out the first pitch? And this puts me at a crossroads as a Sox fan. But due to my aforementioned love of Kansas City and the attempt to close a, 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 a loop of a joke, I was like, I will do it on one condition. If you give me a Royals jersey that has a five and says Goldstein. <laughs> they agreed. <laughs> threw out the first pitch. And by the way, <laughs> I didn't practice because I only found out yesterday, and I didn't have a lot of focus because I'm literally looking at my phone as I'm standing on the, you know, the gravel next to the Royals dugout as Jude Bellingham scores the equalizer for England. And like, and now, throwing up the first pitch. Okay, all right, we're good, all right, go ahead. Anyway, I bounced it in the batter's box, and I deserve that. But more importantly, <laughs> later on in the owner suite, thanks to the generosity of Mr. Eric Stone Street, who you'll meet later, I meet George Brett, and we take a picture of the five Goldstein jersey and immediately send it to Brett Goldstein. Thank you, Kansas City. Ready.
Yes, baby. Do you know who did see the video of George Brett crapping himself in Vegas? <laughs> Brett Goldstein's parents. They watched it and they're like, we're going to call our son Brett. <laughs> in homage. It's like Olivia Newton, John Travolta, George Brett Goldstein. It just fits. It's cosmic. It's beautiful. Um, Brendan, we're poised to break down the Euros. We're going to go deep on the Copa and the United States pathway to glory. But first, as is the way, football's all about making memories together. Win or lose, it's the joy, it's the connectivity. Um, so let's mark this moment on our feet. Kansas City, beers up, let's be having you. Photographer Drew will join us. Let's make a memory together. Everyone, beers up! Respective photographer wearing an Ajax jersey. See, when they see the picture later, it'll seem like a very quick moment that happened organically. It's going to be great. Oh. Brendan. Roger. Zudame Euros, as Angela Merkel or David Hasselhoff would say. And let's... Starting Gelsenkirchen. Did you like that? I've been actually reading a book that's called Derek Ray for Beginners. <laughs> we're we're going to get into a round of 16 game that ballads will be written about. England 2, Slovakia 1. God, a lot of Slovakian fans here tonight. <laughs> Where were you when you were sh <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, if Brendan and I had come here last year, we're like, let's talk about Slovakian football. Would you all be like, yes, we're coming down to the Madrid theatre. Um, who saw this coming, Brendan? Enter England, fear-filled, dull, insipid, impotent football over three games. Um, former legends in podcasts, scathing Almost the podcast, a bigger opponent than the dudes facing them on the field. Um, national scapegoat Gareth Southgate makes one change. In comes 19-year-old Cobby Maynou. I've had him on. I've had him on the show, and he like he is so unbothered by everything. Um, in he comes, facing 48th in the world, Slovakia, who were utterly pressure three. For them, this was a delicious free hit. One they relished with a fearless collective game plan to soak up England, pick their chances on the counter, and on 25 minutes, this happened. Somewhere in Slovakia tonight, they're stopping the game at that moment. Like in North Korea, they don't show anything that happens after they concede. <laughs> but that was 20-year-old, 30-year-old journeyman striker, Ivan Schwanz, which sounds like the kind of name you'd come up with in the Ted Lasso writer's room, <laughs> with a clinical in tearing... In the Hogan's Heroes writer's room, maybe, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he essentially toured the English social fabric. He didn't just score. What the Roy Hodgson's, Brendan? What happened then? I'm sorry, man. What, what, what happened? Like, what happened? Yeah. Oh, the score there? Yeah, I mean, how did you understand that moment? Or were you too busy practicing no, your watching, pitching? No, no, I, we had not got in the car yet. I'm watching this moment. Um, it's just like England, because you come into this thinking like, you know what England need? They just need to get into the knockout rounds, and they just need to feel the pressure, and they're going to show who they are. Nope, nope. Here comes Slovakia, scoring first. Um, and uh, bless the guy for not going down on uh, Gay's pressure there, because if he goes down there, which he had you know, probably every right to do in the, in the VAR age, uh, that's a red card and a penalty, or it would have been a second yellow for Gay, more importantly, because they, they avoid the triple jeopardy, you know. Um, but by just scoring one goal and leaving 11 men in the field, he made a key strategic error. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. We were watching men drown with the nation watching them and booing them rather than trying to save them. I mean, England looked like essentially the presidential debate of international football teams. What, 
it was, it was, it was, it was like humanly, humanly devastating to watch them. I couldn't watch. It was like just so uh, humanly appalling. Um, and at half time, I spoke to my family in England. Um, my dad is really, really, really ill. So like there's a tiny part of me that is rooting for England to do okay so that he feels happiness. Um, he said to me, he said, he, uh, I actually texted you this. My dad said, 1349, the Black Death. 1066, the Norman Conquest. 1776, losing America. I know, I, all, you, all you Slovakian football fans love, love that moment. You do, you do, when we lost America. But my dad said, this ranks up there. I mean, it, uh, he put the photo... <laughs> and it was only 40 minutes in. <laughs> and I th you know, I don't like to be hyperbolic, Brendan. My dad doesn't either. Um, Foden scored, needlessly offside. Harry Kane whiffed over and over. <laughs> um, by the way, English journalist Jack Lang captured the sense of this man flailing. I read this to Brendan backstage. He tweeted, Kane looks like he's running through treacle. And his legs are also made of treacle. And there's treacle in his lungs, and in his eyes, and in his soul. And he's wading, he's really trying, but it's just all treacle. And you can't really tell where the treacle ends and Kane begins. And it took 66 agonizing, feckless minutes just for Gareth Southgate to bring in a substitute. It was like watching a manager paralyzed, shell-shocked, the world watching, and we hit 90 minutes. England had still, I think, zero shots on target. They were waiting for Brendan to bloody well pitch the ball so they could <laughs> leap into action, I think. Um, I mean, by the way, can we just say, we talked about this the other night, to take Bellingham, Foden, Saka, and Harry Kane and make this ball of whatever George Brett did in Vegas. <laughs> it, it, it is almost performance art, Brendan. It's like sullying football in a way that only Salt Bay truly understands. It's as if, because like I'm no sculptor, so I'll put this down into simple terms that I would have understood from the children. It's like when you start with four beautiful, separately colored cans of Play-Doh and <laughs> you're going to make a beautiful fort with distinct, you know, uh, rooms uh, belonging to the different colors. And then, and then, what'd you make, son? I made a pile of brown Play-Doh. That is what Gareth Southgate has done up to this point. Or so it seems, <laughs> going into the 90th minute. <sighs> yes, Brexit means Brexit was the tweet that we had prepared for the final whistle. This was a genuinely a horrible performance, but then another quote from my dad. My dad has always said, in better days, he always said, it only takes a second to score a goal. There's always hope, American fans. And in the 90th minute, plus five, 10 seconds to go in the game, 30 really, but I'm being hyperbolic, this happened. Okay, that's too much. That's too much. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> I mean, because like, for those who didn't see, Bellingham had stopped doing his trademark celebration, and Harry Kane fanboyed his way up to him, like, will you do it again so I can do it with you? <laughs> like he's about to say, can I have your shirt? We're, we're teammates, uh, Harry. We can do that in the locker room. No. <laughs> now. An amazing, amazing goal. Amazing goal. And you, you got to love every time you see an overhead. Um, uh, but also, shout out to, again, Mark Gahey for the assist, because it may be his last act of the tournament, because he's missing the next game. He'll be back for the final, Brendan. But <laughs> I'm getting ahead of it. I've read the script. 
That was a nine, if you're listening along at home, that was a 95th minute overhead kick equaliser, which was followed, I crap you not, by Jude Bellingham mouthing, who else? At the cameras, which is, by the way, I was born English. I'm not now, but I was. I looked at that, I was like, where's his insecurity and self loathing? <laughs> like, is there an operation you can get? As an English person to get, but he's also right. He's also correct, right? Who else? Yeah. Who bloody else? And Jack Grealish was at home being like, me! By the way, can we just marvel together as American slash Slovakian fans? <laughs> Landon Donovan was commentating on that goal while Jude Bellingham delivered in Landon Donovan time. And Landon Donovan was sitting alongside Serene Dark, who repressed the urge to scream, you could not write a script like this! Go, go, England! Which really doesn't have quite the same ring about it, does it, Brendan? <laughs> no, no, not quite. <laughs> By the way, about that all that self-loathing, we have that in the Midwest. Just so you know, like we have that here too. Uh, yeah, I know, but England trademark, they just couldn't afford a lawyer to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> Brexit means Brexit. Um, by the way, it would get worse for Slovakia. <laughs> 52 seconds into extra time, cometh the hour, cometh the cane. Look at that, look at that. Harry Kane has scored hundreds of goals and still hasn't figured out a knee slide. It's a butt slide. Like you've, you've had time, bro. Get this, get this going. You know, it's like I once interviewed Harry Kane and I asked him, the greatest strikers in the world have the skill to make it look as if they have the power to make the ball come to them, which he did right there, right, with Ivan Tony's brilliant flick. And Harry Kane just, I, that's, to me, that's like a layup that Harry Kane can then dunk. So I said, greatest records in the world have a bit of a And Harry Kane looked at me and he goes, I, I said, how do you do it, Harry? And he looked at me and he goes, I don't know, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought about that. I, I thought about that tonight when I watched that. Um, but I also thought, God bless Harry Kane, who did not lose his head when all those around him were losing theirs and blaming it on him. Um, in that second, what a narrative flip. Harry, Harry Kane, suddenly a national hero. Gareth Southgate, suddenly a genius. Football teaches you one thing in life. It really does, and I think it's a very important lesson. It will make a fool out of all of us. We all know nothing. Brendan, football's amazing. You can fume for 90 minutes. You can want to throw beer cans at Gareth Southgate at the end of the game like a complete arsehole. Then three minutes of magical football, three bloody minutes, and you are suddenly walking on sunshine like Katrina in the waves, making memories you will never forget. It is, it is the insanity of it. We just get so mad. We get so very mad, and that anger is so justified, and then a complete turnaround can happen. Um, uh, may, may I sidebar about Harry Kane real quick? Because you've alluded basically to his, bless his heart, mild simpleness, I think. Um, uh, we're, shooting, we're shooting Ted Lasso season one. Um, uh, a, uh, a NFL team who many of you will probably boo, but let's save it for your, you know, Slovakian rivalry with <laughs> Slovenia. Um, uh, but the Bears are playing the Raiders. We go there, very excited. They're playing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um, I, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm an Arsenal fan, fine. We go to the game, um, and uh, <laughs> you guys are fickle and weird, I love it. Um, <laughs> Um, it's at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It's the first NFL game that they are hosting ever. And um, Harry Kane comes out to do the ceremonial 
coin toss. Harry Kane is a huge NFL fan. It's in his home stadium. Harry Kane perhaps was not told that these NFL games that happen in London are mostly attended by Germans. Um, <laughs> Germans and other Europeans uh, who are all fans of other countries besides England and other clubs besides Tottenham, <laughs> and they make up about 80% of the stadium here or, uh, at this game, where again, Harry Kane's home stadium and the other sport he loves, and he flips a coin and is lustily booed in his very own stadium. <laughs> and he has a look on his face that, that seems to suggest, I don't know, really. <laughs> Bless his beautiful, beautiful heart. And by the way, since he's gone to Munich, and there's not a lot of people I could say this about, since he's gone to Bayern Munich, I, I like him much more. And that was what, that moment when he flipped the coin and got booed. And he said, who are these fans? And they said, they're mostly German, Harry. That's, and he's like, oh, that's where the NFL's from. I'm going to move there. <laughs> I, think you, I think you've just got to the bottom of where the hell he moved to Bayern Munich. He's like, I think the Dallas Cowboys play in Schalke. <laughs> Fun fact, the actual NFL Europe League that existed for a while, they had a team in Barcelona and Amsterdam and I think Glasgow. By the time it closed, it had six teams and five of them were in Germany. <laughs> True fact. And Carry do, you know, on. do you know who ran the NFL Europe? Donald Garver. I did not know this. There, there you are. I don't know what to tell you. Ah. A great success of an NFL extravaganza, and now he's running MLS. So, I mean, I'm not here to rag on Don Garber in the way that some of you Slovenians are just going to love doing. Um, <laughs> but so essentially the NFL went, or MLS went like, oh, we need someone who's like good at running a sport but has been to Europe. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it, was, it was either him or Todd Burley. <laughs> and they like Don's PowerPoint because it was like Barcelona Dragons. Um, can we move back to this game for one quick second? <laughs> no, I mean, let's go through the names of all the um, uh, NFL Europe teams. The Scottish Claymores, oh Amsterdam my. Admirals, the Rhine Fire, the or Rhine as Derek Fire. Ray called it, Rhine Fire. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> There's more though. <laughs> Carry on. Let's get out of this quickly. <laughs> By the way, Tottenham Hotspur had a striker, Clive Allen, who was the kicker for the London team. He was Harry Kane before he was Harry Kane. Oh, I don't know, really. Look, I want to raise my Camarena. Oh, the most awarded tequila. Uh, in toast to Slovakia. And I'm not just pandering to all you mad Slovakian bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of am. You're terrifying. Um, but Slovakia can depart. I mean, I think that they depart with two things. Number one, the agony of knowing that they were seconds, seconds away from making national history a quarterfinal. Their goal scorer, Schwanz. Um, I love that his name. I do, I love his name. Maybe if Mr. and Mrs. Goldstein had another baby, they'd call it Schwanz Goldstein, which I just adore. But he said something heartbreaking. He said, we certainly have nothing to be angry about. We'll deal with it but maybe we'll regret it for the rest of our lives. <laughs> those are two kind of extreme, those are kind of two paths. I think that's what Robert Frost meant when he said two roads diverge in a wood. <laughs> maybe we won't give a crap. Maybe we'll just like all become dark, depressed, and it will become like the worst sliding doors remake of all time. Um, but that's the power of football. And I do believe you Slovakians can leave with your heads held high. Um, and I'll say American fans, if there's any here tonight. <laughs> I, do, I watch Slovakia, I really do, as a collective with discipline and focus and organization and a real sense of discipline and fearlessness. I look at them with admiration um, about that performance that we can learn from. Um, just wonderful. But England, Brendan, button it. What do you make of it all for England national team? Um, uh, as, as, as very shit as particularly the last two games had been for England, um, I still subscribe to the notion that, you know, talent's going to get you pretty far, and they remain incredibly deep and incredibly talented. Uh, I did not think that they were going to lose today, even when they were down one nothing. and, um, I think Switzerland's in trouble, uh, and, you know, <laughs> someone just scoffed. 
like Switzerland of fucking power. What are you talking about? <laughs> I ain't not gonna beat Switzerland. That's my Slovakian accent. Uh, <laughs> Switzerland been very good though. I'm not gonna sidebar. We wasted too much time already in NFL Europe. Um, but I think this is prob is likely a springboard for at least another round or two for England. Please God, please God, not that I care because I'm an American now, but. Um, I do wonder where the joy's gone for England. This team, 2018-2020, that unicorn-tinged optimism and wonder, the feeling that everything was possible. Um, I don't know if it is. Um, the English must now play with a tactically savvy and quite deeply organized and clinical and ruthless Swiss. Um, <laughs> wow, the Slovakians find Swiss humor very funny. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. By the way, tonight I'm learning more about Slovakia <laughs> than, than the last time I learned this much about Slovakia, I was having dinner with Derek Ray. Um, but I've got to say, Brendan, I do love the theory that we cooked up on Tuesday on our show where we said that England are going to win this thing, but like every time they play without any convincing football at all, the nation is going to tell them afterwards just how crap they really are. And the joke of it is, football is finally going to come home, only to be booed and told it's total shite, which is perhaps the most English thing that ever English. But if you only take one lesson from this whole thing, this whole game, this 120 minutes of insanity, it's this. Never, ever leave a game too early. Learn from these English fans who exited the premises on the 90th minute. First of all, I think the second guy was, uh, was uh, Dean Smith, <laughs> not the basketball coach, the, uh, the other one. I forget which relegated team he's been a fan of most recently. Charlotte and also, FC. the first guy, um, he, he was not only vaping, but his vape was the size of one of these. <laughs> Good God, man. <laughs> By the way, that guy, the, the first guy looked like my body double. I just want to be honest about that. Uh, but GFOP at TG Outlaw tweeted us, those two men will be the first to say they were at the most incredible game they've ever seen. <laughs> and failed to mention that they left early. By the way, it's possibly the most English thing ever to be pissed off for 90 minutes, filled with self-loathing, fuming, and then to get the chance to go again. It's perfect to hate, to hate, to hate again. Let's talk about the other game very quickly. Spain 4, Georgia 1. Georgia fans in the house? <laughs> Quick sidebar, um, a little bit of a Ted Lasso BTS. Um, there's a character on, uh, on season three of our program named Zava. And um, if you were to play... Sorry, uh, can we just say, there's a character called Zava! Thank you. Um, Slovakian. So Zavia, Zavia. If you play the, uh, the, the uh, Richmond on EA Sports or whatever they're calling FIFA now, uh, you'll learn that <laughs> Zava is from Poland uh, because the actor who plays him has Polish roots. But in fact, um, the name Zava comes from a buddy of mine in LA named Dava, who, after season one, said to me, Wouldn't it be great if, uh, as, you know, starting season two, you, you had like an Eastern European player named Dava? And I had it in my head, and uh, we had to name him Zava because no one else liked the, room, the name Dava for some reason. But Dava, my friend, fellow burner, New Yorker, photographer, is from Georgia. And so I have looked at Georgia with keen, keen interest um, in Zava-shaped form. And here they came playing new tournament favorite, Spain. <sighs> <laughs> oh, I didn't say that story was going to go anywhere. It's just a fun fact. <laughs> Just a long fun fact. <laughs> Zava used to play for the right fire. Um, Spain, who had not so much as conceded a game. This is foreshadowing. Is that what you call it in the writer's room, foreshadowing? 
Mostly we just look at videos of George Brett taking a <laughs> sh actually. Well, that's what, I don't know how you say that in Spanish, but that's what happened. Actually, George Brett taking a sh is called five shadowing. <laughs> All of fame. Um, I always get booed at least once in these shows, by the way. And that, I'm going to shoot for two this time. We'll see how it goes. Carry on. Let's hear it for Brett Saberhagen. <laughs> Semi, uh, 74th in the world, by the way, Georgia. Portugal Slayers. They were playing again another team, free of expectation, hungry to take on another Iberian Peninsula power. <laughs> Two teams met in qualifying, Spain won, aggregate 10-2. So we all watch with lazy eyes, but this being the Euros, and the Euros being very, very drunk, 18th minute, Georgia showed Spain, they weren't ready for the SEC. And this is great and glorious leader Kim Jong-un signing off North Korean television. Oh, by the way, if you're listening at home, that was Stetson Bennett with a goal. Making imposter syndrome one, Spain nil. That was Georgia's very first attack. I mean, total panic, stunning cross by Kakabadzi. Sorry, Derek Ray, I just effed that up. By the way, Derek Ray is the first person in history who doesn't give a crap about football, but uses football just so he can say kakabadzi if it's as if he was, like, born there, right in Georgia. Poor Spanish defender, Lunelmand. I mean, just a nightmare into his own net. How about them dogs? In that moment, what did you think was going to happen? Uh, well, you think if they can get through to halftime, then that's going to make uh, Spanish players nervous. Did they make it to halftime, Rob? I'm going to spoiler alert you, that's called a lead. And Georgia, they conjured exactly zero shots on goal in that first half. Was somehow ahead. The goalkeeper, Mamadashvili, standing on his head until... Brendan, thank you. 38th minute. Oh, and Hamon, Hamon. Rodri, bloody hell, the percentage of goals that Rodri scores to important goals is almost one to one. So patient, so clinical. God, Brendan, why is there no romance in football? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we better hope there is come tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> golly, there's still romance, Raj. Come on, call me Brenny some more. <laughs> Second half, one-way traffic, or as they say in Spain, one-way autopista. 52 minutes, piece of teenage kicks magic. Laminia Mal, 16 years old, 11 bloody months. An exquisite assist, deft touch of a tender lover. Fabian Ruiz prodded home, then my lord. 75th minute, we need to look at this. 21-year-old Nico Williams, cool game. Stunning lightning football, Brendan. It was like the Sagrada Familia in terms of its uniqueness. Spain, singular in this tournament. Um, always love a uh, Sagrada Familia um, reference because you know what it implies? It implies that their masterpiece is yet unfinished. Can we just thank Comedy Bang Bang for Brendan's ability to improv? Because that is effing genius. <laughs> and it leaves us on the cliffhanger. Olmo would add a four. Spain march on. I just want to say, 
We're going to talk about the Cooper in a second, but here's what I love about this spade. Watching them propelled by this young, effervescent Nico Williams, Lamin Yamal, both sons of immigrants, Nico from Ghana, Yamal, his roots in Equatorial Guinea and Morocco, symbols of a brave new face of Spain, a nation that's a mix of cultures, all the better for it, which is honestly when football is at its greatest. It's a mirror to the nation, reflecting it to the world. Spain versus Germany this Friday. I mean, this is Pablo Picasso Guernica derby. Um, Brendan, two powerhouses enter, one powerhouse leaves. Comedy bang bang, please help me out here. <laughs> Pablo Picasso Guernica derby. I mean, these come for George Brett Skidmark, stay for their art references. <laughs> this is fantastic. It's going to be a great. It's, I mean, that's. That's the kind of game we watch the Euros for. I cannot wait for that. That'll be proper. God bless who do we, them. Who do we think, uh, make noise if you think Spain will beat Germany? Yeah. Make noise if you think Germany will beat Spain? Yeah. How many of you think America's going to win the Euros? Yeah. God bless this country. That's called a pivot, because it's now time to talk about the real deal, the pure uncut wonder that is the Copa. Oh, which is the bastard offspring of Comabol and CONCACAF. For... Mexico got eliminated before the tournament. It was always Mexico. Man, that, that long-seated Mexico-Slovakian rivalry is finally paying <laughs> off. I've been watering it, nursing it, knowing that someday it'll be shouted back at me in Kansas City. Glorious. Oh my God. Shed a tear for Cristo Fernandez. Cristo way, Fernandez, lovely the, man, the deserves Slova better. The, have you, I've never understood this. Maybe Derek Ray will know, Brady. Why do the Slovakians hate the Mexicans so? <laughs> to walk. It's like Brighton and Crystal Palace. It's just like unfathomable, but I'm sure there's a reason. I mean, the Cooper is like a dogfight played by prison rules with pool cues and homemade shivs. And after the trauma of our loss to Panama, we now face Uruguay, who in the group stage have looked essentially like a varsity team warming up by devouring JVs. They've got a plus seven goal difference after two games. Even Darwin Nunes kind of knows where the goal is. He's on fire. Um, by the way, Darwin Nunes, he's on fire. Your defense is terrified. Chaos God has scored in seven straight games, 15-time Copa win, fifth in the world. That's a team we need to beat to get out the group stages in a tournament that we are hosting. Give me straight, Brenny. How are you feeling? Um, I am feeling stupidly comfortable. Is that like your cover version of Comfortably Numb? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like, I want to I feel it. I want to feel my stupidity. To be numb to it would be silly. A reason why I love you is you are the most optimistic man in the world. You are here. You're here to watch the game. You are here to watch what? Um, I am here because I've had this on the calendar for a very long ass time. And I was also in Atlanta for the Panama game. I will spare you the details, but, but suffice to say, I have never had more struggle to get to a soccer game in time than it was getting to Atlanta for USA Panama. And on the way there, I'm like, I'm doing this for... USA Panama, Jesus, and and um, it's turned out it was a pretty eventful game and uh, almost worth it. And 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 we're we're gonna get into it now, but I will say the events of that game, I am undeterred. Tomorrow's game has been on the calendar and thus in the hearts of our players for a very long ass time. And tomorrow is going to be at the very least memorable. And let's go. I love that. I love that. And I love you. We're all clapping Google Calendar at the end of the day, and I love that. But I've got to say, I'm trying to rationalize a lot of emotion right now, which has never been my strong suit, if I'm being honest. But I'm trying to tell myself, our mission has not changed as a nation. We always knew this team was going to have to come into this tournament. Our Gen Z goals, their big test would be facing a big nation in a big game that was a must-win. 
I think we kind of thought it would be the round of 16 against Brazil or Colombia. But it's come early, and in a way, the challenge has remained exactly what we thought it would. And to dig deeper on the US men's national team's unerring journey to glory trademark, Kansas City, let's welcome our first guest, a native, a hometown hero, a graduate of Blue Valley West High School. Go Jaguars! <laughs> In Overland Park. Let's get this straight. There's more of you here from Slovakia tonight than North America. It's amazing. I love America. 30 miles southwest of downtown after being drafted eighth in the 2009 MLS Super Draft. Number eight, seventh pick was for the, uh, the Rhine Fire. Thing. <laughs> he spent a dozen years with Sporting Kansas City. He made 294 appearances. Scored three bloody times. He won one MLS Cup, three US Open Cups, made 47 appearances for our beautiful national team. <laughs> By the way, I love this. He, sc he scored once in a 2018 World Cup qualifying game on the very same day his first kid was born. He's an amazing human being. Kansas City, please be upstanding for the very first Kansas native to feature in a Men's World Cup. He's one of your own. It's Mr. Matt Beasler! Do you speak Slovakian? No. Oh, it's going to be a long night for Matt Beasler. All right. <laughs> I'll translate. Or do you want to translate? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a shot. I do want to say something real quick. This is off script. Uh, we were down in the green room watching some soccer. In real time, uh, Mexico just got eliminated from Copa America. Now it's official. Now it's real. So, hey, even if the worst case scenario happens tomorrow, Mexico got kicked out before we did. All of this is hanging over us, is that the one thing you need to understand, it could always be worse. We could be Mexico fans. Matt Beasler, you beautiful human being, it's incredible to be with you. I want to say, I loved watching you as a player. You were such an incredible, as Sade once sang, smooth operator. <laughs> she was singing about Matt Beasler. She was. You were a leader on that field. I mean, I remember when you were first called up to the US national team, August 2012, by Jurgen Klinsmann. Um, you made nearly half a century worth of appearances. You were a left-footed centre-back. You were so cultured. You played in the Cooper Centenario in 2016. You actually started in that quarterfinal win over Ecuador. Are there any Ecuadorians here tonight? Are there any Slovakians here tonight? Yeah. America's amazing. By the way, at the time, you called it a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But here we are. We're back in the Copa. We're coming to Kansas City tomorrow night. What's this tournament like? Can you give us a sense from your own memories, Matt? Yes, yeah, so I, I participated in the 2016 Copa America, and for us it was a chance to play different teams. You know, I, I think we get into a rhythm of playing a lot of the CONCACAF teams, and it's a certain style, and you know, it's, it's CONCACAF. I don't have to say anything more, it's CONCACAF. And so, as a player... How would it, you describe that style, Matt? How much time you got? What level of karate did you achieve in your dojo? Are you a black belt? Yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, but but I think it's a as a player you want to play against different teams. You want against you want to play against some of the best teams in the world. So it's exciting to to play against South America because they have some of the best teams in the world, and it's a different style. 
out of the dojo onto the football field. I mean, let's talk about this, this Cooper, this team. We sit here at a time of challenge um, after the Panama game, which Brendan was at. And you played in another time of challenge. You played in, and I don't know if this is too soon, you will tell me, no doubt, Slovakian fans, Trinidad and Tobago 2, USA 1. And I only raise it, because I know it's sensitive for Slovakian fans. 1776, Slovakia. I mean, that game, I raise it because you played in a game where, like, you're all American. You're running around in an American jersey, and you're like, fight or flight. Like, you guys are trying your best, and you can't believe that the team are going down in this fashion. What does it feel like to experience that, you know, just like that, that, that time of challenge? What do you all, when you watch the game this week against Panama, did you have, like, a flashback to those moments? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I didn't realize we were going to be talking about Trinidad <laughs> tonight. Um, we got Six a knee on the Trinidad team. <laughs> Aji Ray. Can we have a word with him? <laughs> it's too late. Too late. It's, it's too out late. there. He's already <laughs> asked. Uh, you know, I now that I'm not playing anymore, and I get to I, I get to think about what it was like to play and have all these experiences. I. I, I, I truly am blessed because I had such a wide range of emotions throughout my career, and I get to sit here and, and tell people, like, look, I've had the highest of highs. I've been on the field to qualify my nation into a World Cup, uh, but I've also had the lowest of lows. And, and so, in some ways, that strengthens me and because I'm still here, you know? And it, and it doesn't phase me. Like, I, I was on the field in Trinidad, and it was awful. Uh, the thing I can remember about that game is trying to process everything afterwards in the locker room. Uh, we were all stunned, but when you get back into the locker room and you start having interactions with your teammates, everybody's in a different phase of their career and their life. And so I remember seeing Christian Pulisic, who was the youngest player on the team, he was in tears. Because I think for him, he had this dream of making it to his first ever World Cup. And he wasn't able to get that chance. But right next to me, on the other side, was Tim Howard, who was also in tears, who maybe had just played his last ever national team game. And so, in, in everything in between that. And so the range of emotion and different stages of people's careers, um, that was my last national team game too. So, you're trying to process, is this it? Am I ever gonna get a chance? Is this the way that I'm gonna go out? And uh, nothing can prepare you for those emotions. You just have to go through it and here I am. Well, that, that is a positive difference. Thank you. Thank you. Between, between what the guys have gone through in that Panama game uh, versus uh, in that game that I, I thought we weren't gonna talk about, um, is these guys do know they have a next chance. They have, they have that chance tomorrow. They have had all week to think about it and, uh, and to prepare. So let us, let us hope that that is meaningful. I mean, by the way, a young Tim Ream was watching the Trinidad and Tobago game and saying, I'm just 57. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope his middle name, I can't believe I haven't thought of this before, but is his middle name David? Is he Tim D. Ream? Is he Tim Dream? <laughs> or is his middle name Charlie? Nah, forget it. I'm going to be other thing. <laughs> oh, with that ponytail, I'm thinking Charlie. Hey, let's move on. Okay. It, his, his middle name is Brenny. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, by the way, you mentioned Christian Pulisic. You did play with him. He was on the field with you that night. He cried on the field. He was a kid then, a teenager. He scored, even in defeat that night. What do you see in him now? I mean, you played with many of the greats. You played with Clint Dempsey. You played with Landon Donovan, the big dogs. How does Christian compare? Is he the best outfield player we've ever produced in the entire history? Was, was, was John Quincy Adams 
lesser than Christian Pulisic is what I guess I'm asking. Uh, is he the best ever right now? Outfield player. Uh, I'm not ready to say that yet. I'm, I'm an old guy, so I, I think he, he's well on his way, uh, certainly. But uh, I remember Christian coming in, and right away you, you recognized that he had something different. Uh, for me as a defender, you know, even in practice, if you're going 1v1 against somebody, you're trying not to look stupid. And there's some guys where you feel more comfortable than others, but he was a guy that made you feel uncomfortable. And what I would have to do when I would go up against him is I would basically just have to back off and just give him some extra space because I didn't know if he was going to go left or right. I think that's one of the best things that Christian has in his game is his balance. And he can go left or right just as well as anybody. And so as a defender, you're basically guessing, is he going to go left? Is he going to go right? I don't know. I can't really tell. He doesn't have any tells. And his first like two or three steps, his acceleration is, is rapid. And so he can get around guys with ease. Did you ever feel like you had no choice but to run up behind him and swing your left leg like a bat? <laughs> and chop him down mid-run? Because you're just so sad and desperate, that's all you have in your toolbox? I'm sorry, again, I was there and I'm very bitter. Very, very bitter. I've been in that position a lot when he's dribbled past me, but uh, to answer your question, no. I did not reach out and kick him. Thank you. That, that question did not even deserve an answer, and you're a gentleman. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I feel like I'm in a court procedural, and Brendan Hunt is going to shout out, Objection! Overruled! And withdraw his own question. But I do admire you so much. I really do, Matt, because you don't want to anoint him as the best outfield player ever, because you know that Graham Zuzi is going to text you when you leave the stage. <laughs> can, can we hear it for Graham Zuzi? Amazing, amazing man. And by the way, Panama, I was in your stadium when Graham Zuzi broke your heart, you callous bastards. <laughs> um, can we talk about this moment, this squad, this team? Um, there's so much incredible pride that we all share in the fact that this is the first time that our starting 11, um, as I said earlier, yes, not even in like, Abraham Lincoln's time, we didn't have this. And like Jefferson or whatever, um, have we ever had a starting 11 from our nation who all played in the top five leagues in Europe? Yet we find ourselves in this moment of challenge on the verge, I don't even want to say it, Hercules Gomez told me this horrible word, grouped, which is like so violating, it's unbelievable. <laughs> especially out of his mouth. <laughs> How do you understand when you watch this team, so many incredible individual talents, the challenge that we face in this moment? Can you explain it to us? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's, there's no denying how talented we are. Uh, I'm excited now that I'm a fan. Uh, I think it is, uh, it's a very bright future. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think that uh, we're too inconsistent right now. Game to game, camp to camp, tournament to tournament, there's too many ebbs and flows. So for me, I, I need to see more consistency. But the one thing that, that I'd like to bring up that I don't think gets talked about as much is that there's a lot of talk about where the players are playing. We got guys playing all over Europe. We've got guys playing at the top teams. I think that is great, right? And I'm not sitting here saying that that doesn't matter. But I think we need to look at it further and, and look at what is everybody's role on those teams. And I think right now, we have a lot of people playing over in Europe and playing at top clubs, but they all have the same role on the team. They are, be, they are supporting players, right? They're young, they don't have a lot of leadership, they maybe don't have as much responsibility, and they are supporting. When I experienced the teams that I was on in the national team, we did not have players that were playing in Europe. We did not have players that were playing on top teams, and we took a lot of shit for that. But, the, but what we did have was the roles that we all had on our teams were, were positions of power, of responsibility, of accountability, of captains. I go through the roster that we had, and again, there was a lot of MLS, MLS players, but you could go down the roster, myself, 
captain of sporting. Kyle Beckerman was captain of Real Salt Lake. Michael Bradley was the captain. Clint Dempsey, uh, Tim Howard. I could go down the list. But Bedoya. Bedoya. Bedoya is captain of, of, of Philly. And so, uh, you know, talent-wise, the teams-wise, yeah, I don't think it stacks up. But again, I think the, the role that you have at your club team, that is the team that you're there every single day. That is your life. That is what makes you. And I think we need to see more people growing into these roles, uh, being captains, being leaders, taking that weight and bringing it from their club team to the national team. Because again, I think right now at the club level, the club teams are great. The names are great. But we, there's too many supporting players. Does that make sense? So, A, bravo. B, what I'm hearing is, if we're going to have guys in Europe, more of them should play at Everton. <laughs> like, take the responsibility, please, please, please. Look, look, let's look at Tim Ream right now, okay? Tim Ream is the oldest player on the team, but what qualities does he bring to the team right now? He's the captain of Fulham. He's the captain of his club team, so he brings leadership qualities every single day to his club team, and I guarantee that he brings those same qualities to the locker room in the U.S. Now, yeah, he's a great player. He deserves to be there, but I think a lot of the reasons that he's there is because of the leadership yeah. attributes that he has. This is fascinating to me because, like, we, we hear about this conversation about, yay, it's so good, the guys are in Europe all the time because of, um, you know, the guys who they're going up against in training, you know, and the high level just around the whole periphery of their experience. But... I've never heard about this through the prism of having less responsibility. That's interesting. Very e interesting. E Everton had Anthony Robertson, and he left us. <laughs> Come back, Anthony. Come back to us, Daddy. Um, <laughs> can we talk about Greg Berhalter? Because I know that you know him. <laughs> Slovakia, stop it. <laughs> Slovakia, I know it hurts to be eliminated. This now, hold a, on. Now, Greg should not have told that guy to get a red card in the 20th minute. That's bad. That's bad coaching. That's on him. That's on him. Oh, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know you know him. So I am fascinated knowing him. I mean, we know that the players love him. That's why he got rehired. It was a player's choice. We know that a number of the fans have doubts which they make very, very manifest. Um, in terms of right now, with the question is, is this the gentleman to propel this team to the next level we dream of? But Matt, of the human beings here, you're the human being that knows us. So can you tell him about Greg Berhalter as a manager in your own words? Sure. Uh, I've, never, I've never been coached by Berhalter. I've never been in the locker room with Berhalter, but I do know him. I, knew, I know him well enough to uh, have a good sense of, of who he is as a coach. He's very detail-oriented. He's very intense. Uh, he, he's very passionate about being successful. Uh, I think that he uh, obviously connects with his players. Uh, that is clear, right? The players love him. And again, I'm not in the locker room, so I don't know exactly how he does that. I'm actually curious to know how he does that. You know, is it... Is it texting with players? Is it having one-on-ones? Is it visiting them at their clubs? He does something to connect with his players to get them to buy in. Um, but I think tactically, he's in a bit of a, a predicament because I think naturally he's very hands-on in the way that he wants to coach his teams. Uh, they want to be very meticulous about how they play and how they build out, and they want to go over a lot of details. And I don't know if that's the right approach for national teams. I think it's very difficult to do that. Um, again, I, I've, I think you have to have the right balance, right? It's, it's balance. Like, you can't go into a national team game without talking any tactics because then you're going to feel unprepared, and that's not a good feeling. Jurgen uh, Klinsmann <laughs> tried that, but... Many... I didn't say... I didn't say who. <laughs> Well, no, that was his methodology. I'm not going to tell. By the way, Jurgen Klinsmann was a man who said, when you take a penalty, 
don't think about where you're going to put it, because if you don't know, then the goalkeeper won't either. <laughs> Which, by the way, I've thought about a lot, but like genuinely, when you carry that through... But, to, to finish my thought on Burhalter again, I, I think he... <laughs> he uh, the, the team, from what I can see, the players believe in what he's doing, and that is the most important part. And, and so, until I see differently, I, I, I can get behind the direction that they're going. Um, but again, I, I think that he's got to find the right balance of, hey, look, for two days we've talked about tactics. This is the day of the game. I want you to go out there and, and play with your heart and be physical and run past your guy that you're playing against and win your 1v1 battle because we're Americans and that's what we f***ing do. And, I tell you, we need to get that man who rips the telephone books apart again. I, we? We no, need to get him back. I, I'm serious. When you play against teams in CONCACAF or even from South America, I don't even care who you play against, they fear playing against Americans because they know they're going to be in for a long night. And so what I would do, again, I would focus on the tactics leading up to the game, but I would make sure I remind teams to, to say, like, look, sometimes tactic, tactics don't matter. And... We're going to pressure the team, and we're going to go, and we're going to go, and we're going to go. And the goal may not come in the 25th minute, but I can guarantee by the 70th minute, they're going to be so tired of the Americans not giving up and being in their face that they're going to start getting, you know, they're going to, the spaces are start going to open up, and they're going to start making mistakes, and we're going to start pumping in goals, and we're going to win the game. Yeah. Woo! Oh, my God. We need... We need that Brad Pitt speech, and they will fear the American. I love this. Essentially, what you're saying is, Greg, if you're listening, just put on Sean Deitch's tracksuit. <laughs> Tell your lads to F it with that fancy football crap and just F crap up. You know, what do you expect tomorrow, both of you? I mean, genuinely, we are here in Kansas City. We're playing Marcelo Bielsa's Uruguay. El Luco is suspended, but his bucket will coach the team from the sideline. <laughs> and we fear the bucket. We fear the bucket. Yeah, not as bad as George Brett fears the bucket, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, had no idea how much mileage I was going to get out of that tonight. Anywho, um, I, I, I truly believe that um, much like Portugal in 2002, Uruguay is going to be surprised by the intensity of what they're gonna come up against tomorrow. And something we didn't even have in 2002 will be a incredibly pro-USA crowd. And this is something I found in Atlanta at the Panama game. We've talked a long time, or you've probably heard a long time, and I know you have experienced, you know, the US is the only country in the world who plays their home games with away crowds. And yet, last night, or the, that last game in Panama, that was a majority US crowd in a stadium that holds 60,000 people. And I have a good feeling that Kansas City is gonna turn up tomorrow and give the same. So I am optimistic about tomorrow, but I defer to the far smarter man than me. I mean, tell What's us how the question? I, I, the, I don't even know where we are anymore. By the way, you're a Slovakian crowd here tonight. Can you found it in your hearts to cheer for the United States tomorrow at Arrowhead Stadium? Here's the question. I mean, what I found most fascinating about watching Greg Berhalter teams is that ultimately in CONCACAF, we maybe have spent a lot of time trying to replicate Barcelona 2008-2009 era, which is, I think, what you're saying here. And I think it's like our inferiority as American soccer. We, try, we don't just try and win, but we try and think what other people think about us, which in international football... You don't give a crap. It's just about winning, like pragmatic football. And when this team have had their best results under Greg Berhalter, it's where we play that gritty, reactive, fighting football against Brazil 10 days ago. I love you. Look at you. You're like in raptures, and I adore it. I feel this is the closest I've ever felt to being like Joel Osteen watching Matt Beasley in this moment. By the way, watching us play England in the bloody World Cup again. We didn't try and, like, 
we weren't dazzling England with our disco moves. We were just like, okay, we're going to F you up. We're not afraid of you. Come at us, bro. We'll choose our moments. It's a dog fight out there, dog. So what do you expect tomorrow? What should we be doing? What do you hope for in your heart of American hearts? I, I expect we're going to show up, and I think we're going to win the game. I just, I, th I think that our backs are against the wall, and we laid an egg the last game against Panama, uh, and I just don't see, you know, American teams, I, I don't think we lay an egg two games in a row, especially at home. Here's what I want to know, seriously, from the booth of you. United States has won in big tournaments. This actually pisses me off. I'm going to be candid. It's going to get a bit dark for one moment before it gets light again, America. Since 1990, we've won one massive bloody game in major global tournaments. And we won it against Mexico in the World Cup. It's like the Confederations Cup means nothing to you, Raj. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Johnny Infantino, bring it back. Just so we can, like, prove Brendan's point that it was an important tournament. Look... It's almost unfathomable to me. We have seen Georgia do it. They beat Belgium. We've seen Slovakia do it. We've seen Slovenia do it. We've seen all the Slavs do it. We've seen Iceland in our... We've seen Wales do it in previous tournaments. Here's what I want to know. Seriously, guys, why never us? I mean this seriously. Why... I sound like a Sunderland fan in Sunderland Till I Die. Why is it never us looking a massive team in the eye and saying, yes, we're going to F you up, and we're actually going to do it? Are you talking about U.S. or England? <laughs> I'm actually asking. I didn't know who you were talking about. <laughs> Why would I care about England, Matt? <laughs> what part of you thinks I care about England, genuinely? I'm genuinely serious. When I pledged allegiance to the flag, I pledged allegiance to the flag. Matt, this is an Upper West Side New York City accent. <laughs> Raj May used to have sung the, the UK national anthem, but they've changed that anthem since then. <laughs> He's one of ours now. So the question stands. Uh, my, my, I just, I genuinely, I used to say, I can't say it anymore, I'm more American than Kid Rock. <laughs> so, I've got a Graham Zuzi poster above my bed, Matt. <laughs> Why never the us, the United States? It's a, it's a good question. I, I think that we, we play different teams. And, and I think a lot of the teams that we play, we are better than, right? The CONCACAF teams, a lot of World Cup qualifying, on paper, we're better. And I think in those games, uh, instead of trying to play pretty soccer and work the ball around, I think we got to go out with a, a, you know, more intensity and be more direct that's what I saw against Bolivia. I, I was really pleased the way that we went out against Bolivia. I thought that we were going to come out and try and work the ball and pass through them, but that's not what I saw. I saw that we came out flying. We were hungry. We were playing balls in behind. We were putting the, the other team under pressure. We were creating set pieces. We scored our first goal off of a set piece, right? The thing about major tournaments, all the stats, what do they say? The, uh, over 50% of the goals are scored off of set pieces. How do you score off set pieces? You have to get set pieces to score off set pieces. And then you have so, to hire a new set piece coach. Yeah. So anyways, I, I, think, the, uh, I, I think that that's the approach that, that we have to take, is just be on the front foot, and that's what I'm looking to see, and that's regardless of the opponent. Okay, what? it's time. This Uruguay test... Feels like a Mission Impossible, but I've watched all of the Mission Impossibles on a flight to Kansas City today. <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen them. Yeah, that's true. We circled. 
don't know if you've seen those movies, but Mr. Tom Cruise, he always pulls off those Mission Impossibles. But he won't be playing tomorrow. So I want to know, what gives you both the most hope? And then, spoiler alert, tell us what is going to happen tomorrow. Both of you, put us out of our misery. Tell us how it's going to go down. Brendan. Um, I will uh, defer and repeat this, or revisit this question at a later time. I defer to our wiser guest. <laughs> this has suddenly become court TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're going to put in a great performance. Again, I think we're going to show up. And right from the opening whistle, I, gonna, I think you're going to see energy, intensity. I think we're going to be on the front foot. Uh, I see us winning the game 2-0. I love it. I also like the fact that uh, the, the national team has an incredible record here in Kansas City. By the way, it's going to be 2-0. Who's going to score? Graham Zuzi gets the first goal. Who gets the second? <laughs> Jossi Zardes, you are. In the face. Um, it, I think it's a fascinating clash. This is a US team that's got a proud track record in these games, when we've got our backs against the wall, going back to Honduras and World Cup qualifying, going back to the World Cup proper against Iran. Um, we also have a tough track record against big teams. This is going to be the moment where those two stories collide. We have enough talent. Can we summon the idea of football we need? I really do believe. There's an incredible GFOP, Kerry Bruckner, who sent me a beautiful email that I've thought a lot about. It's from psychologist Rollo May who wrote, courage is not the absence of despair, it's rather the capacity to move ahead in spite of despair. So I'd just say to a courageous performance, a lights out Matt Turner showcase, a magical flow Balagan moment, a 1-0 victory, and then let's just pray that Panama don't beat Bolivia 3-0. Matt, you are proper Kansas City. It's a joy to be with you. Um, I mean, I do believe in every regard we are lucky to have you in our lives. The amazing thing is, you retired. You're just a couple of months younger than Tim Ream. He's still playing. He's crushing it. Well done, Timmy. By the way, I wish he could play tomorrow night. Am I right, Kansas City? Can I just say, Matt Beezer, Kansas City is lucky to have you. Everything feels calm, rational, straightforward around you. The world makes sense. Give it up for the first Kansas native to play in the Men's World Cup. Kansas City, it's Matt Beezer! Bonus content. I just got to do this real quick. I'm on stage with you all. The last time I was on stage at Power and Light, I chugged some beers, by the way. Uh, I got to get a USA chant. Okay, here we go. USA! 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 Thank you very much. I needed that. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Beasley! Oh my God. Is it, this is one of the greatest nights in Slovakian American relations, Benny. And now, as an encore, Matt Beasley will perform from Hamilton, My Shot in its entirety. <laughs> that was great. great. But it does speaking to Matt make you feel more optimistic about what's going to go down tomorrow night? Uh, I would, but I can't feel more optimistic than I already do. <laughs> then I'm going to take your good vibes. I'm going to move them up to 11. Because um, our next guest will blow us away a little bit deeper in terms of our optimism in this unparalleled um, sporting culture. This 
joyous city of fountains, it's time to bring to the stage another Kansas City native son, a favourite of Casey and the nation two-time Emmy Award winning actor for his role as Cameron Tucker on Modern Family, but he's truly revered among my kids as Duke from The Secret Life of Pets. <laughs> a gent who taught the entire nation how to boldly wear shirt sleeve cuffs. Kansas City, please be upstanding for a great American. It's Mr. Eric Stone Street. We've been drinking. <laughs> Hi. You're waving. Hi. How's everybody doing? Uh, I would have not had met George Brett today without Eric's intervention, by the way. So he's already made the show better. Oh, <laughs> thank you. By the way, this feels like this is the beginning of the Eric Stone Street for Kansas City Mayor campaign. Yes. I'm announcing, announcing my candidacy. Wow, you guys have you've really been drinking up here. <laughs> we don't treat our guests very well. You get one cup. Yeah, I have air. <laughs> can we get Eric Stone Street no, to drink? No, I have, I have James Sorry, can we get the mayor a drink? Um, Eric, you were born here in Kansas City. You lived in a two-story wood shingle house, five acres. You raised pigs. Cows lived in an adjacent 40 acres. When I heard that fact, I was like, my God, life ambition to be one of Eric Stone Street's cows. Um, I come from New York where like, you can't turn a corner without bumping into someone. So as someone who was born and I feel like I'm a deaf person. I have to watch your lips as you're talking because I can barely hear you. That's fair enough. All right, I'm going to watch like... you. So don't think I'm weird. I'm but, just going to stare at by you. By the way, this is, not, this is not rude of Eric Stone. My wife speaks to me this way. She's like, I can't understand you. It's not about understanding. It's that too. But I can't hear you. <laughs> That's fair. What I'm saying is, Eric, what makes Kansas City special? The spirit of the city. Oh. Man, so so many things. You know, I lived in Los Angeles for 20-whatever years. I spent two years in Chicago after leaving Manhattan, Kansas. Kansas State. And then I moved to Los Angeles for 20-plus years, found some decent success there. And then COVID hit, and I moved back to Kansas City. And let me just tell you, it's been an amazing experience retethering myself to this town but more importantly, these people. Uh, we love uh, the folks in Kansas City, so the answer, what makes Kansas City special is, are the folks, the people. I always say, when someone here at the grocery store asks me how I'm doing, it doesn't mean who's your agent and can I send them one of my scripts. It means how you doing, which is a real treat. Um, but you know, Look, we love being seen, right? Because we're not Philadelphia, we're not New York City, we're not Los Angeles. And most people associate sports and you know things like that with those large market teams and areas. So that when something like this, the soccer match tomorrow night or the World Cup coming in a couple years, that's when we have the NFL draft here, it makes us so proud because the world is getting exposed to the city we love. So we're very passionate people. We wear a tremendous amount of Kansas City stuff. <laughs> um, you were, you were, uh, Brendan was wearing a Kansas City hat today. I'm like, well, he's one of us. Monarchs, he's, strictly monarchs. monarchs. Couldn't do royals. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, my, my answer is, is the people. We, we, we're, we're good people here. So how was that decision? Like, you are a human being that could live anywhere in the world. Hollywood. Yep. Hollywood. Yep. Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood. 
what made you decide, no, I'm going to make myself, my life back here in Kansas City? Yeah, a couple, a couple things happened. Uh, Modern Family ended. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, the, the, my, my dad's health, don't want to bring it, bring it down. Uh, but he, he started to decline. My fiance was traveling back and forth from Kansas City to LA for three years to make our relationship work. Then COVID happened and I'm like, what the f am I doing in Kansas City? I'm out of here. Or I mean in LA, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, I'm just kidding, I actually live in LA for Kansas City and all the people. Bunch of assholes. I'm LA all the time, baby. Take me to Rodeo Drive where I can get a $3,000 shirt. He rips off a mask and he's Johnny Damon. Uh, I mean, I'm really sorry that uh, Modern Family got canceled so early and never got a chance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe your, maybe your next show will be worth a damn. Uh, yeah. Love your work. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, but but a, 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 a collision of circumstances brought me back and um, you know I'll tell you it's a it's it's a beautiful moment that I had with my dad where he was sitting in his chair in Kansas City before he passed away and he looked at me and he said well Eric I sure never thought you'd come back home and I said well dad I, I didn't think I would either which was the truth it was a profound moment because here I'd had this, you know, had this career, have this career that I was going for, that they were so supportive of, and I was doing it, and it was happening, and at the top of, you could get, you know, with the TV show, and, and now all of a sudden I'm back in Kansas City and can have lunch with my mom and dad and be with Lindsay anytime I wanted. It was, it's been crazy. It's a, it's, it was a gift to have those two years with him that I never in a million years thought I would have. Because I was so self-absorbed in Los Angeles. <laughs> Doing cocaine constantly. The cocaine I remember at that time Kansas Andy Dick came up to you and was like, Eric, settle down. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh my God, my father is very sick at the moment, Eric. Oh. And you, I, I realize I am about to go back and move to Liverpool. Oh. And do a lot of cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is not about me, it's about you. It is. Um, <laughs> as a child, you played a lot of baseball. You were an offensive lineman in football. Track, field, shot put, discus, you did it all. You essentially, you invented the decathlon as an Olympic sport. <laughs> Um, you did one golden year of soccer, yeah. um, but nowadays you watch the Chiefs religiously, baseball, huge Royals fan, yep. owner, Olympic track and field, but you've been getting into the other football sport in Kansas City and you've attended KC Curran games. Can you explain the Eric Stone Street soccer evolution? Well. I told uh, somebody that works for the show that my biggest memory of playing youth soccer was that the coach brought lemon and cucumber to the, in the water. And I was like, this is awesome. This is the best tasting water I've ever had in my life. <laughs> are we, are we? No, no we're, oh, not. Oh. we're not, we're not, I love you. But, I thought it was a, a By the way, thing. Ooh, we're touching the hips. <laughs> By the way, that feels amazing. <laughs> That was the worst break dancing of all time. <laughs> By the way, the coach that Eric's talking about is obviously Peter, Peter Vermes, yeah. right, Benny? <laughs> I, love, I love how deep we get to go on this show. Because, like, usually I would only make a Peter Vermes reference among friends. But here I can make it in front of hundreds of people, and they get it. <laughs> this is great. Uh, and, and then, you know, I kind of hung up my, my soccer shoes and my shin guards. There's a lot of running around. Just a tremendous <laughs> amount of movement. And you ran track. Yeah. Oh, oh, I threw things in track, let's be clear. <laughs> I picked up heavy things and tried to throw them over there. Uh, uh, and then, you know, I, I, I uh, got into sporting Kansas City and then this beautiful stadium that Kansas City built, the first one in the world for 
for professional women's for sports. professional women's sports. By the way, let's do that. For that, that deserves that. Yeah. <laughs> we have a thing now. I know, you and I, every time we see each other, we're gonna, win. we're gonna. If we're in the NBA, that would be our handshake. Um, but it is amazing. I mean, this this team, this town, has birthed the first ever women's professional, solely built, purpose built stadium for the game. It's beautiful too, and and I'm so happy for them and happy for the city and the attention that it's gotten and. You know, I love the pageantry of sport. So it makes sense that when there's a soccer match on that means something, I'm invested. I'm going to be there tomorrow night. Go Uruguay, uh, USA. Oh, no, we went over this. No, we went over this. No, God. Uh, uh, what did I, do? I knew when you said Kansas City was going to be a problem. God damn. God damn. Oh my God. By the way, I'm, in, I'm proud this, this, to be in America. <laughs> Oh my God, there's nothing, there's nothing that can piss off a full house of Slovakian fans <laughs> more than cheering for really, Uruguay, are there, Benny. Are there really Slovakians here? Oh yeah. And the thing is like, like, you know, there's a big rivalry between any countries who have capital cities with a V in their names. So <laughs> Bratislava Montevideo is just such, such a dogfight, <laughs> really is. They probably pronounce it Montevideo, but you know, you get it. You don't know what I'm talking about. Can you explain to me, I mean, you are a co-owner of, um, of the Kansas City Royals. Slovakia. Kansas City Royals. Come on. You're a graduate of Piper High School. Kansas City, Kansas State University, official model. Motto, rule by obeying nature's laws, which always befuddles me. Um, and one of nature's laws is that there's no better place than a Kansas City Chiefs tailgate. I mean, you are a rabid Chiefs fan. Yeah. The U.S. men's national team is about to enter Chiefs territory tomorrow. Yeah. Can you describe a tailgate in this town to a national audience? Describe the carnage to someone that has not had the pleasure, Eric, please. Yeah, well, you stop at the grocery store and you get a tray of, sh of sushi. Um, yeah, yeah, that tracks. Oh, no, sorry, that's yeah. L.A. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's the tailgate at a UCLA football game. Never mind. Um, ooh, a lot of big UCLA folks here <laughs> offended. Uh, listen, there's a line to get into the stadium. Like if there's a Chiefs game at three, the line is at, the, the stadium opens at six and people are tailgating in the line to tailgate. Like <laughs> that's common here. So they, they show up and get their grills out to wait to get in to light their grill. They got a, a, a line grill and a tailgate grill. But uh, you know, it's incredible all season too. You know, uh, they have heaters and fire pits and everything like that. It's you know, John Madden said it best that Arrowhead's the best smelling stadium in America, and you can't beat it. That's right. And I hope tomorrow. I hope tomorrow that there's a, a representation of that somehow. I'm I'm hoping that Kansas City shows up. Uh, and shows our wonderful Slovakian guests. Um, are there really Slovakians here? What the f Several were naturalized during the show. Okay, so. right. hey! Slivovitz. Uh, isn't that the, the, the drink of Slovakia? The, you know what Slivovitz is? No, I think they, I think they drink Michelob Ultra. I think I just. <laughs> what did he say? What did he say? They're drinking. They happen to be drinking the sponsored beer, most oh, likely. Okay. Um, but it, it's it's uh, wonderful. It's uh, great, and uh, I hope uh, we get to experience a tailgate tomorrow. When Americans fly in and visit Kansas City for this Copa and this World Cup, what do you want them to take away? from this experience? How do you hope that they leave having viewed your hometown, Eric? Well, I hope they leave having a positive experience. You know, when we played the, the uh, Philadelphia Eagles last year here in Arrowhead, um, yep, we had, we had beaten them in the Super Bowl and then they had to come back this last year. <laughs> 
And I spotted two Philadelphia Eagles fans uh, on the mezzanine on my way to where we sit at Arrowhead. How did you spot them? Philadelphia Eagles fans are usually so bookwormish. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he's, so he's not um, going to name names, but it was Rob McElhenney. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I politely went over to him and I said, "Hey guys, has anybody told you to go f yourself yet?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and the guys are like, "No, do you want to be the first? I'm like, "Actually, no, I want to say, welcome to Kansas City. I hope you have a great time." Unlike all the Eagles fans at the Super Bowl last year were to me. So enjoy our fair city. Uh, <laughs> I sure hope you can say f on this. It's come up. Okay, yeah, okay, we're all okay. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but I want people to experience the good folks here. I want them to experience barbecue uh, in the proper way that they can. I want them to experience the tailgate. I want them to see the diversity of the city, the museums. We have some really great museums. And just know that we, uh, we're a thriving metropolis with a lot to offer to lots of people. And then I want them to get the fuck out of here. Because <laughs> I'm not bringing traffic from Los Angeles to Kansas City. <laughs> oh my god, this really is the mayoral inauguration of Eric Stone Street. Yeah. By the way, the museums here are incredible. I do want to just say, the First World War Museum. Oh, it's incredible. It's, in, it, it's, it's such an unbelievable immersive experience. Uh, I highly recommend going to that. Bob Kendrick, who runs the Negro League Museum here, is a national, he's a national treasure that we are lucky enough to have as a, is he here? No, he's not. I just released a film From where Slovakia. I interview Bob Kendrick and everything you're saying is utterly, you're, you're deputy mayor, I think yeah, you'll be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, the, the Negro League Baseball Museum and the First World War Museum, Kansas City, you're both the nicest group of human beings in the world. And you also hold up some of the most important stories about America to America and make us understand them. Yeah. And that's what I love about your city. Uh, and then I promised you next time you're here, I'm going to be responsible for getting you on a little meat tour. I want to take you to a few places that uh, are off the beaten path that have contributed to this. Um, and this too, I'm 87% yeah, yeah. made up of burnt ends. And I, I told Eric where I'd been, and he was like, no. He said, like, that's not real barbecue. I'm going to well, take you to real barbecue. Yeah, don't, shh, quiet. I was in Philadelphia one time. I was doing a show, and I got myself in trouble in many cities when they would ask. In oh Chicago, God. what's your favorite deep dish pizza? And no matter what you say, it's like the wrong answer. So I was like... If Pequods. It, Pequods is good. Uh, uh, you know, it's fine. Um, the answer's Jim's cheesesteaks if you're from Philadelphia. No, 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 no. So, so sure enough, in the middle of the thing, somebody yells out, what's your favorite cheesesteak in Philadelphia? And I just said, Subway. <laughs> oh, my God. a chant of like, no, no! Oh, there's no right Who answer. Who is that guy? He's from Modern Family. What was that? It was on ABC for a little bit. <laughs> Couple episodes. Oh, man. Eric. What? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we've discussed this enough tonight. We've got quite an important game of football tomorrow in your oh, yeah. city. 24 hours from now. Um, I don't want to be hyperbolic. I would never be hyperbolic. It does feel like a moment um, where the future of democracy is on the line. <laughs> and as a search for positives, I think about, God, it's being played here in Kansas City. Who are the Chiefs, the Royals, the current Sporting KC, and Slovakia? Yay! <laughs> A 
as we say in Liverpool, get behind the lads. You are someone that has experienced every kind of KC sports. Tell us what this crowd tomorrow night is going to sound. You're going to be there with Brendan together. What's it going to feel like, guys? What's it going to sound like? What's it going to be like during this massive game? What's it going to sound like? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's good. USA! 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 I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, I, uh, nothing better than a great USA chant. I mean, I think we're going to have that. I thought you meant, like, what's it going to sound like down on the field of, like, ch -ch 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 -ch. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to be that close, bro. Like... <laughs> hey, over here. <laughs> and then... <laughs> I think it's going to be amazing. And uh, I, I, here's what... I had this epiphany at the coldest game at the Miami game. You know, everybody was talking about canceling that game and it was too cold to go out. And as I'm sitting there in the stadium, I'm looking around and all the people filing in, in their parkas and their gloves and everything, it, I got emotional. So for the same reason I get emotional at like a parade. It's like, look at all these people like showing up to support this thing. Ah, it's amazing. And I think tomorrow is going to be that kind of a feeling for me as well, because here we have this great world thing happening in our city and Kansas City is going to show up and just be ama amazing and loud and boisterous and people are traveling in from all over like Slovakia coming to the game and, and we get that spotlight put on our great city again and it's, it's awesome. I mean, is that what you want me to say? <laughs> I guess, I can't wait. I can't wait. I love going to Arrowhead for any reason. And, you know, I, I don't even go to concerts at Arrowhead, but I'm going to this match, you know? Will this be your first, um, will this be your first national team match? It will be my first national team match. Can I just tell you, statistically, Eric Stone Street has never seen the U.S. men's national team lose That's in right. person. And I'm not going to see him lose tomorrow night, or I understand the coach is gone. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Brendan, you're taking him, so why don't you close this beauty? Close the whole thing? Uh, not the whole bloody thing. Not the whole bloody thing. Just, just the Eric bit? Eric Stone Street, just say you're an inspiration. You're a burst of joy. Aww. An optimism that we need in a time of chaos like this, something like that, that reminded it in life eventually. We all return to where we started. We're all just salmon swimming upstream, Brenny. <laughs> we, Bre Brendan and I know from improv that the way out of a scene is always through the beginning, right? You always go back to where you started from. And that's what it feels like me coming home to Kansas City is I went off on this journey to find success and I found some and now I'm back to where it all began and it feels phenomenal. Eric Stone Street, ladies oh. and gentlemen. Eric Stone Street! Be upstanding! <laughs> Your next mayor. Stone Street! Holy sh**, Brenny. What a night. What a night. What a human being. <sighs> By the way, when he said we all end up where we began, you all know you're going to be deported to Slovakia very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy it while you can, lads. Um, Eric is not our only guest tonight. <laughs> oh my God, what did I just say? Eric's not the only guest tonight who knows his way around the face paint, which he's going to be putting on tomorrow, the red, white, and blue of the United States.
because as I mentioned earlier, I was here three weeks ago doing a live show for the KC Current, and I was telling the, the, the story of this team, the world's first stadium purpose-built for a women's team, and one of the pictures we popped up on this screen was this fan. The Teal Man. I, fucking, I think the Avatar movies are so great. They're so great. <laughs> Honestly, I looked at that photo and it filled me with joy, optimism, enthusiasm, belief that anything is possible. And I want to say, at a time we need this, it's a joy to bring to the stage to close this show with fanatical zeal. Kansas City, please be upstanding for another one of your own. It's Richard Harper, your teal man. Teal man. Real man, teal man. I hugged him before and it took me about an hour to get all the tinsel off my shirt. Um, You'll find it three months later. Uh, can I just say, they say never meet your heroes, Brendan. I mean, up close, like, are you, are you, are you airbrushing it? Like, with your, the blending is really, really amazing. Uh, no, I just slap a shit ton of paint on there and call it good. Well done. Well goddamn done. <laughs> Richard, you are a singular, wondrous human being. I mean, one visage of your being can just like make me want to run through walls, which is why I wanted you to come up here today. And we just heard Eric Stone Street's origin story. <sighs> Tell us the moment you first looked in the mirror <laughs> and thought, you know what? I'm going to unleash my alter ego and become the Teal Man. You know, I'll just start off with a couple of things in the, in the past of just being silly and, and being a goofball uh, and just kind of combining everything together. Uh, I used to be a, a music teacher, a band instructor, and for uh, the Christmas parades, they used to put lights and tinsel on their instruments, and some kids would be a little nervous about doing it, looking silly, and I was like, well, if you feel silly let me look like the biggest idiot out there. So I decided to do a big old glitter beard for that. Uh, and then uh, coming to Kansas City was like, man, I gotta find something to do. Royals are cool. No, I don't wanna do that for the Royals. That's, that's a lot of sitting and that's a lot of, I'm gonna sweat all that glitter off. So I was like, well, the current, there's an idea. And it was just real fun to one day go, you know, let, let's get some uh, teal paint, let's slap that on, let's get the glitter going, and let's have a good time. And I think we've all been having a good time, haven't we? Richard, I don't know if you know, and this Slovakian crowd don't care, but the United States are in a do-or-die situ tomorrow night. Fans in Kansas City are going to be a very important part of the proceedings. Brendan will be there. Eric Stone Street will be there. Can you tell us, what will we feel? What will you, when you sit there in that packed out, I mean, you sit in the KC Current Stadium, bellowing for your undefeated team with several thousand of your fellow Kansas Cityans. What's it going to feel like in the Arrowhead tomorrow night? I mean, uh... It's going to be electric. It, I don't think it can beat that 11,500 uh, capacity crowd that we get every game at the uh, current stadium. But, uh, no, I mean, it's going to be electric. We're going to show them what Midwest sports are about, and I, I'm excited to see the crowd get riled up. God bless. I've got to tell you, it warms my heart to spend time with you, knowing that we're all rooting for the same thing. There's a chant in Lola Bantaland the KC baby chant. Can you just end proceedings tonight? Explain it to the audience at home. And then I think it's a fitting way to end, to end this evening together. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's something that Lola Bonta really helped bring together. And uh, it's a big cheer we do to start every game. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. We'll say one, two, three. And then, oh, you already know, you're all so good. 
Uh, and we'll all say KC Baby. Sound like something we can do together? Yeah. All right, here we go. You ready? Yeah. No, you're not. Are you ready? Yeah. Thank you. All right, here we go. On me. One, two, three. KC Baby! That's right. Richard, I got to tell you, that noise is the sound of light emerging from the darkness. You are a special bloke. All that's good about American fandom, you thrilled me. The image of you meeting you tonight is honestly the joy of my trip to Kansas. It's the act of consciously making memories together, which I hope you're all going to do tomorrow night. Kansas City, please be upstanding for your till man, Mr. Richard Harper. Bless, that is a man that leaves an impression wherever he goes. We have reveled in a true gem of a sports town. We've taken a 12-hour break from the meat sweats, to which I'm going to return in about half hour. I'll meet you all at Town Topic Burger. Um, tomorrow, our gents play Uruguay. That embodiment of football in chaos. 75,000 fans will be there. 1,000 Americans, 74,000 Slovakians. <laughs> Speak to the team. Imagine they're listening to you on the bus ride to Arrowhead Stadium tomorrow. Brendan, what's the pre-game hype speech you would want our gents to hear? I guess, <clears throat> I mean, I would just have to speak from, from what my current experience is here, assuming I got here to Kansas City, and then I flew back to where they were, and I got on that bus, and then I came back with them on the bus, I would tell them, hey, guys, Kansas City didn't start out great for me. I got to the Airbnb, and you know how sometimes you go to Airbnb, and, like, the remote control is just missing? <laughs> and it was, and I couldn't find it. And then when I finally found it, I turned it on, and it's like some kind of crazy-ass cable package where I can't find anything and like the remote doesn't even really work now it was oddly I didn't know this existed but it was on the FIFA channel apparently there's a FIFA channel but hey I don't need to watch the Croatia Brazil game from 2022 again so that's fine put that away that's fine getting back into it because I'm just now I'm reveling in the Kansas City of it and the USMNT of it because let us not forget yes it went bad after that red card in Atlanta but there was fight after that there was fight Notably, uh, Follerin Balogun had the best game he's ever had for this team. And you already know the fight you're going to get from the guys who've been there longer, Pulisic, McKenney, whatsoever, etc. And here's the thing, beyond all that, we are in Kansas City. And I know for a fact that there's a winning vibe going on here because I know the Royals won their last game. And I know Sporting won their last game. I know the Current won their last game. And I hear tell the Kansas City Chiefs won their last game as well. So maybe that winning vibe this city provides will keep on going because here's one more thing. When I turned on that TV this morning, it was still the FIFA channel. And you know why? And this is absolutely true. John O'Brien's face was on my television this morning because they were showing, that at the exact moment I turned the TV on, they were showing footage of the U.S. beating Portugal 3-2 to two in 2002. The last time we had to play such a highly ranked team. And all of that speaks to me and says it's going to be one hell of a game tomorrow. And we just might shock the world. And that'll be because of Kansas' goddamn city. So let's go play the goddamn game. Hashtag believe. try and translate this into your language. If Slovakia can beat Italy, yeah. and 
anything's possible, right? So dream big things, Kansas City. Really dream bloody big things. This is our time. This is our turn. I truly believe it. Also, I'm praying Uruguay are going to rest most of their starters. <laughs> Not that it matters. <laughs> Do you think this is... I think there's like an equivalent in Montevideo tonight where they're like on stage, but like, we fear the United States. <laughs> God, I hope that is true. <sighs> I thought you were going to tell me you couldn't find the remote control and when you flicked it on, you put Fox on and you just found the f***ing bass fishing. <laughs> Look, our show's almost done, but the night is not. We will be retiring to John's Big Deck, 928 Wyandotte Street. Going to meet you, we'll raise a glass with you. Um, but I want to raise my last Camarania of the night to you. I want to say, Brendan, it, it improves my life to spend time with you, laughing with you. You brought your partner, Shannon, here tonight, which has been the joy of my week, to be candid. I've loved shoving my face full of sweet, sweet, sweet Kansas City barbecue. I love this city of cities. And tomorrow, I can't wait to watch the United States roar into Marcelo Bielsa's Uruguay. And please, Lord, the Copa America knockout rounds are still reachable. Let us not doubt the size of the task, but let's approach it with hope and belief in American glory, to a day we draw closer together, to a day we can put arm around each other and our loved ones. Can we celebrate the way football binds us together as communities, city to city across this great nation? I had a letter from GFOP, Jordan Williams, who wrote me this. He said he hopes someone, and I'm guessing it's Tyler Adams, because he's the US player most likely to read Shakespeare. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Tim Ream is second. Yeah. I think so. He, he's going to read the epic soliloquy from Henry V, which I think Tyler thinks is, is a, a play about Thierry Henry V. <laughs> <laughs> and I quote this line. Tyler, say this to the lads before you go out. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Cooper America shall ne'er go by from this day to the end of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds blood with me shall be my brother. To America. <laughs> One last toast to Brendan Bloody Hunt. Incredible human being. Incredible. And because he won't do it himself to Roger F Bennett. Most importantly, to Kansas City. What's a city in Slovakia, Brenny? <laughs> Love Slovakia. Always have. <laughs> That's it. Charlotte, we're coming to you next, July 9th, night before the Copa America semi final at the Bank of America Stadium. The US will be in that one. Sam Mewis is coming with me. Dean Smith, whom I love. Carolina Panthers, defensive end, Derek Brown, proper football. Tickets available now. New York, come and have a drink with us on July the 8th. Um, Kansas City, just want to say thank you from Brendan and myself, for, for Eric Stone Street, for Matt Beasler, for the Teal Man. I just want you to know, you are one of my favorite cities in the entire United States. Now, come and have a pint with us. Huge, huge love. And if I may, to, uh, to a local boy who is not with us this summer, it's a damn shame, but uh, Shawnee Mission East Grant Wall. Grant Wall, ladies and gentlemen, never forget. If anything should teach you, to not take a second for granted, to make memories while you can, to revel in every football match as if it's your last, and just savour, look left, look right, the company that we're in, 
ultimately, that's what's important, America. Huge love for me, big love. Thanks for having us. Courage, USA! go, go, USA!